Okay, this is Holy Week. We're talking about Jesus' passion for us. The scripture in Matthew chapter 21, verses number 6 through verse number 9. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the coat, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before, and those who followed, cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Jesus' passion for us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. And we believe that. That when God looks on the world, he didn't look at the sins of the world. He saw the need for a savior. Rather than judging, he gave us Jesus. He knew that there had to be something that was done. And when Jesus was walking on the earth, it was John the Baptist who saw him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was that perfect sacrifice that was needed by all of us to take away all of our sins. But even with that, Jesus knew that he came to die. That's our fate. Nobody makes it out alive. None of us makes it out alive. But Jesus came with his one mission. He had to defeat death for us. We're all going to die. As, as terrible as that sounds, and Pastor, be more positive. Okay, I'll do this. I'm positive we're all going to die. I'm reminded of the old man who was complaining to everybody that would listen, always complaining about his health. And at one point, he finally died. And he had put on his epitaph, I told y'all I was sick. They're always complaining. Jesus, during Passion Week, this was called Passion Week because with the passion that he had for us, it took him all the way to the cross. His passion for us, that he loved us that much, that he knew that he would die because the world needed a sacrifice and he came to be that perfect sacrifice for our sins. So we call this the passion of Christ. It's when he made his triumphal journey into Jerusalem, that place of, in Jerusalem where they, they would say, Hosanna! They were screaming because they wanted a, they wanted a savior. Hosanna wasn't a, a, a cry of worship or a praise. It was saying, save us. Hosanna, Lord, serve us. They were under the oppression of the Roman Empire and they wanted someone to save them and give them a new authority. So they thought that certainly Jesus is the one. And Jesus came into the city of triumphantly riding on a donkey. And on three different occasions, Jesus told his disciples that he had to die. On three different occasions, he says that I must die. But one of the things he always did, he never talked about his crucifixion without also talking about his resurrection. Without a crucifixion that can't be a resurrection. We want things to be resurrected. We want things to get better, but, but we don't want other things to die. In order for some things to get better, sometimes things get worse. Anybody identify with that? In getting to the better, you sometimes go through that valley of the worst, that night season that you go through. You know, there are five D's that we tend to go through that, that are life-changing events from people's lives. And we wish we didn't have to go through them. But there are five D's. The first D is death. That's the first life changer. When there's death, sometimes of a parent or a loved one, and it makes us reflect on our eternity. We look through the lens of time. We get a glimpse on what really matters most after something is gone. So death is the first transition that we'll face. One of the next ones is disease. Whenever you've had some debilitating disease and you have to overcome it, if you, through God's grace, do overcome something that really puts you down and out, it makes you think about the eternities of life. People that have come back from serious disease where they've been given months or weeks or some short time to live, but by God's mercy, they get a turnaround. Suddenly it changes everything. 
All the things that mattered before that didn't really matter anymore. Their priorities are shifted. They see nature differently. They see the beauty in the world, the beauty in people. They smile more. They have a greater appreciation for life because of what they had to go through. One of the next D's is divorce. That'll set you back a while. You think that, well, yeah, divorce is one of those things that we, we, we go through it and, and, and we love to build it amicably, but more times than not, it takes out a little peace from us. You're not the same by going through that. But one of the things that Jesus taught them, the three things he taught them during this week, first, you have to go through this. Make a note that you have to go through this. Some things you don't want to go through, but you have to go through this. I went through the three Ds. The last one is depression. I don't know if everyone went through it, a serious and deep depression. And when you climb in that hole, it's hard to get out of it. I've never been in there, but people that have been in there will tell you it's a deep, dark hole, and it's hard to get out of. Some people say, oh, just get over it. Oh, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. I, I know it's not that easy. I haven't been through it, but I, I know it's not that easy as it sounds. But when you go through that, and when you get back again, and you breathe, air and you breathe life again, it makes you feel good to know what it's like to feel good. But going through those, sometimes your life won't change unless you go through it. You have to go through that. You know how we're stubborn sometimes. You can tell a person that, but they don't get it. They got to go through it. They got to touch that stove to see that it's really hot. Was that you? That you, you had to do that? Don't touch the stove. Okay. But the first thing you want to do is touch the stove. But sometimes you got to go through it to find out that the, that the pain that you feel is real. But God makes you through it, lets you go through that. So the first thing Jesus was letting them know during this week is that you have to go through this. You have to go through this. Some things get better as other things pass through. We wish that we didn't have to go through the difficulties in life. We wish that we didn't have to endure the pain. But the pain teaches us. Pain is a teacher. It allows us to see what it's like when we really feel good again. But it took the pain to remind us of what pleasure is like. Because we can take for granted things if it gets too good. We can forget what time church is. Do you still have church every Sunday? Because things are going so well now. I've got money. You can't hear with all that change rattling in your pocket. You know, you can't hear with all the, everything's going so good that I, I've got so many things going on now that I, I don't have time for church anymore. I don't have time for all the other things. I've got so much going on. But then life comes along and it makes you reminded of the things that really matters most. We should always keep the main things, the main things. Remember the priorities. Don't let anything shift your priorities around. You can get so busy with a promotion and, and advancements and all the things in this world, things that you can't take with you. You can't take anything with you that you, you, you build up a legacy of stuff down here and you can't take it with you, but you can build up love and, and peace and joy and goodness and gentleness and long suffering and faith. Those are things that you can pass on to generation to generations. So Jesus told us, number one, it had to happen this way. The next thing he wanted to teach them was death would not win. That was what he wanted them to know this week. Even though he's going to die, he's got to go through this, he's going to death, is not going to win. You can't conquer what you're not willing to confront. If you want to defeat something, you've got to face it. If you have a fear of death or a fear of failure or a fear of heights or fear of open places, you will never conquer it unless you confront it. So in order for him to defeat death, he had to face death and he had to conquer it. And he did that for us because you and I won't have to deal with that. We won't have to face that. He says, in this world, you and I will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So as a believer, to be absent in this body, we believe that we'll be present with the Lord. The one death, the real death that we had as Christians when we died to self, that was our death. When I died to me, when I'm no longer living for me, I'm now living for him. That was the death that we suffer. When we take off on this cross, we become that, that person that we would desire to be, that God desires us to be. We really die to, to self. And then we take up that cross every day and we bear that cross for him. So number one, we, it had to happen this way too. Death would not win. Number three, that God is not done. 
That was the other point. God is not done. God has a plan. Wherever you are, whatever your difficulty, whatever your trouble, God has a plan. And here's another thing. His plan for you is good and not evil. His plans are to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans give you hope and a future. That's the God we know, the God of hope, the God of love, the God of new beginnings. Not that God of despair, the troubling God, the, 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 the wringing of hands God, the trepidations God, the God of fear. No, he does not give us that spirit. He says, you and I are powerful beyond measure. That whatever it is, you have the power within you to overcome it. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in every one of us. You got the power. You pray for God to give you the power. God says, you use the power that you've got. If you use what you've got, you'll get more. Faith builds upon itself. You use the faith you've got, then your faith increases with what you're using. It's like exercise. You get out there and you try to run a mile, you pass out. But if you use that effort, if you use the strength, if you use the endurance you've got, you'll get more. The next time you can go a half mile. And then that mile that you used to struggle with is now easy for you. And then you're up to five and ten. And you say, I might just run a, a marathon. And, and that, it starts with a single step. That effort that you place may be difficult at first. But just because something is difficult doesn't mean that it's not meaningful. It doesn't mean that it's not for you. That God will give you things that's easy. No, nowhere in the scripture says it'll be easy. He says with God, all things are what? Possible. Possible. But nowhere does it say it would be easy. But one thing he does say is that I will be with you. That no matter where you go, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. He says, I'll be with you always. Always? Always. Even to the end of the age. So if we would just stay our course, it's amazing how your life would be one testimony to another testimony to another testimony. And God keeps getting better and better and better. But we've got to continue in that same faith. Amen? Continue in faith. Imagine what the last seven days of Jesus' life would be. I don't think I'd want to know when my last week would be. I don't think you want to know that. Imagine if you say, if you knew you're going to be gone next Sunday. And that, would, that would be a terrible thing. I told you about these three guys who love baseball. And they were saying, is there, heaven in, is there baseball in heaven? That was the question. Is there going to be baseball in heaven? And they had to say, well, tell you what. The first one that dies, and you get to heaven, let, the, let us know. Come back and let us, somehow give us, let us know if there's baseball in heaven. So one guy died, and, and late at night, one of his friends hears something at the foot of his bed saying, Psst, Joe. He said, what's this? He looks, and that's his friend. He said, Joe, I got some good news. I got some bad news. He said, what's the good news? He said, that's baseball in heaven. And Joe was, he said, wait, 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 but that's bad news. He said, what's the bad news? You're pitching this Sunday. <laughs> you never know. You don't want to know when your last day is going to be. You want to just, you want to just, just suddenly just go down and out and you know, you were here one day and you were gone. You were here and you were gone. So Jesus' final days, Passion Week, he made this journey into Jerusalem. And here he is riding on a coat, this donkey, and, the, and he's riding in and the people are waiting for him because they wanted someone that would save them. And, and that's the problem we can have with Jesus, that we want him as our, as our Savior, but not as our Lord. We want him to save us. And okay, Jesus, I thank you. Now, I'll, I'll let you know when I need something else. But Jesus wants to be not just Savior, but Lord. So they were just saying, Hosanna. And they were throwing palm branches out. And all these palm branches, and everybody was just rejoicing because our Savior was here. But the same one, same ones the rest of the week when he didn't prove to be what they wanted him to be at the end of that week was saying crucify him. The same one that they were saying Hosanna rejoicing about now they're saying crucify him. We don't want to be that hypocritical Christian that prays and when, when our prayers are not answered suddenly we start to doubt whether this is really the God that we want to serve. I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer so I'm mad with God. Some people can take that approach. I'm, I'm mad with God, like God owes me now. You know, it, it, he's still God. No matter what you go through, he's still God. 
If you don't get your answer to your prayer, he's still God. You got to reconcile with yourself that you'll love him unconditionally because that's the way he loves you. You don't have to be perfect. He loves you anyway. Regardless, when you were bad, when you were out there like you lost your mind, he was still loving you. When you messed up and you did all of the things you know you should not do, he still loved you. His love never ends. It's, it's unceasing. He loves you eternally. But that day when he came in, can you imagine that day, this parade and Jesus coming through and they got palm branches out there and they're waving, Hosanna. I remember in, in, in church, they used to pass out palm branches on these days. You remember, they ever been, had palm branches passed out? That was a, that was a, we should do that at some point. We gotta remember that next, next year, next year. B-Y-O-P-B, bring your own palm branches. There was a little boy who, who was uh, sick, and when he came, when his parents came home, they had palm branches because of Palm Sunday. And he was asking, what's that, what's the palm branches for? And they said, well, when Jesus came by, the, the, everybody waved palm branches. He said, the one Sunday I missed, Jesus shows up. That's just the way it is, isn't it? <laughs> First thing is Jesus came to die. Jesus came to die. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. So Jesus knew he had to die. You may have had relatives who, who, who predict their own death. Sometimes, you know, old way back parents or grandparents used to predict, see, I'm, I'm going to be gone here soon. I'm going to be gone, you know, coming up or whatever. And you know, oh, mama, you're not going to die. Big mama, you're not going to die. You're going to outlive some of us. But they had this sense of knowing that that time was coming. And they sometimes want to prepare their children. That if you want to see me, you know, they would you want to get everybody to come together. And they would try to make things right. I want you and your brothers to get, to, to get along. I want you all to make things better. And they try to reconcile the family because they wanted to, when they leave, they wanted to put things in order to know that they've finished what they've come to do. And we should always be living with that eternity in mind. Don't wait until the end to start getting things together. Let's keep our life of peace. Let's bring things together. Let's, let's live in harmony with one another. The Bible says as much as possible, live at peace with even your enemies. Even the people that don't like you, find a way to live at peace with them. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. The Bible says vengeance is mine. Life is too short to have misery and anger and fear and trepidation and resentment toward anybody and hostility. That's a burden that we need to let go as soon as we can. And the sooner we let those burdens go, the, the better our lives can be, the healthier we are. Because we're not burdening anybody else with our hatred. Your anger, your resentment, your hostility doesn't burden anybody else. It hinders us. It hinders us. Over time, it all shows up on your face, remember? Everything shows up on your face. Every worry line, every anger, people smile and they still look angry when they're smiling. That's just because they've carried it around for so long, they can't take it off. Don't live your life being a grump, a grinch the whole year. First John chapter number four, verse number 10. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the pro propitiation, right? How do you say it? Say it? That for our sins. That means the satisfaction. That means that when God accepted Jesus, he's accepting for the sins that we would have to suffer for. Because what the wages of our sin? The wages of our sins are, are death. So if that's justice, then we would all be dead. Because how many have sinned? Everybody have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's why Jesus came along, so that we do not have to suffer for those sins. Past, present, and future, he's nailed them on the cross in Calvary. He's carried our sins, and we are forgiven. We're not forsaken, we are forgiven. We're not perfect, we're forgiven. Not free to sin, but free from sin which means we have 
the ability to stand over it, to, to rise and or to rebuke it. We're not a slave and a bondage to sin. That means we have a choice. If we sin now, as a believer, we've chosen to do that. Because you have the ability to now resist it. Through the power in you, you can rebuke that sin. But some sins, Pastor, some sins less than other sins. And, you know, I mean, some sins are not that bad as others, right? Right? Is that right, Pastor? Because we're not ready to get rid of all of our sins yet when you come up with that kind of stuff. Well, Pastor, I mean, isn't some sins okay? I mean, can't, not nobody's perfect, you know. You, we try to justify our petty sins. As if I've got petty sins, then there's those big, big dollar sins that get you into hell. Now, I'm just, I just got petty stuff I'm dealing with. You know, sin is what? Sin is sin. And when you come to Jesus, you have to empty all of your pockets. You have to empty everything. It's the little ones that's just as bad as the big ones. In fact, I would say the little ones can be worse. Because the little ones lead into what? Even bigger ones. And that little one just turns into more and greater and more of the same. Just get rid of it all. Turn your life completely over. Jesus died and came as a perpetuation for our sins. Unfortunately, the, the praise that people lavished on Jesus when they recognized him as a savior but not as Lord. They welcomed him out of their desire for a messianic deliverer. And we can want deliverance from him. Deliver me from our sins. We even pray, lead us not into temptation and deliver, deliver us from sin. You know, we pray for that because we, 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 we desire not to go into that. But we have to know sometimes you go into that and you have to stand against it. You have to stand against that with faith. The next one, first one he came to die, the next one he was blameless. Jesus was blameless. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for he, meaning God, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And this is the one I'm just giving you. It's not a, there's not a verse on that. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Jesus was made sin for us even though he knew no sin, he was made sin so that we might become righteous and accepted by God. The innocent suffering for the guilty. The innocent suffers for the guilty. And we must imitate Jesus. I know we've all probably been accused of something that we didn't commit. Somebody, you got accused of something that your sibling did or something someone else did or everyone got, a, got punished together for something that someone has done. You know, somebody did something bad on the team, so the whole team has to take a lap or take laps. Sometimes we all suffer for the sins of, of others. And what is that teaching us? That those who are strong should bear with the infirmities of the weak. We should be lifting up and upholding people around us. Because if you got yours and somebody doesn't have it, then they have to get theirs. No, you share yours with them. And that's how we both have. And as you share your light, your candle will never go out. God will make sure that you have an abundance. If your heart is right, he feels what's in your heart, not what's in your hand. Don't worry about what's in your hand. It's what's in your heart. God will make sure that your hand matches your heart. And if you have a heart, a desire to give, then God will pour so much in your heart that your hand just won't hold enough. He'll keep giving you more. And the more you give, the more what? He gives back to you. And I ask the question again, can you beat God giving? No matter how you try, you can't beat him giving. But what he does, he says, do it as you desire in your heart. If your heart desires to do something, God will make sure that whatever your provisions will match your heart. There may be people right now, if, if, if you've got a dollar and you won't give a dime, you won't give. If he gave you a million, you won't give anything more. Because your heart locks it up. I remember one time praying, and this is just giving you an example. It's not boasting or anything. I remember I first started tithing, and that was a big revelation to me because I didn't know if it worked. I've heard about it, and I said, no, nah, that's a church trying to want you to give money. I'm not giving money to the church. I'm not giving, you know, that's, that's, what we, that's the mentality that we have until we try it. When you prove something, then you can say it doesn't work. But you can't say something doesn't work if you never tried it. Is that right? Yeah. You can't say it doesn't work. So the only way I could know that tithing did not work is I had to what? I had to tithe. 
So I remember just starting to tithe, and I and I, so I was, and I then wasn't tithe. first I was pledging. I wanted, I started giving ten dollars a week. Just you know, drink, and that, that was working good. I, fifty dollars a week, you know. And I remember I told you at fifty dollars a week I met Kim. That was fifty dollars a week I met Kim at fifty dollars a week. <laughs> I said, God, what if I gave you a hundred dollars a week? Well, anyway, anyway, but that was, but. I'm saying tithing works. It, it works. It and I started giving more. And I wanted to give. Then I started to 10%. So I started giving 10%. And then I started to say, you know, that feels good. Because the more I would give, the more God was blessing me. I'm giving over here and God's just blessing me. So it was working. I'm, I'm, I was overwhelmed. And I remember once saying, I would like to give I think it was like $10,000. That was my goal to give it a tithe. It was $10,000 in one time, a tithe. $10,000. That means $100,000 had to come my way to give $10,000. Is that God? Can, can God do that? Well, I want to let you know, within, I don't know what period of time, God allowed that to happen. He allowed it to happen. There was a piece of land that we had. Didn't know we were going to sell it. Someone came up and said, look, I would like to buy this land. So how much? It was like a hundred and some thousand dollars. Isn't that God? Isn't that God? What's in your hand? God wants to use what's in your hand. It's more what's coming out of your heart. Because the hand that gives, the empty hands that give, don't stay empty for long. Don't worry about empty hands. It's the empty heart that's the problem. If your heart is full, your hands will always be full. Your cupboards will always be full. But when your heart becomes empty and cold and calloused, nothing can flow through a cold and calloused heart. You'll see people that can give when it's, when it's a little bit, but when they start getting more, suddenly they start turning off the valve on their heart. They want to give the same thing they have been giving, those twos and fews. Even though God gets poor, open up the floodgates of heaven, they want to keep on siphoning to God. That's a, that's a problem. That's a heart problem. I always tell you, giving is not about what's in your hand. Giving is not about finances. Giving is always about the heart. See, because when you, when you got your heart right, you'll give much more than finances. You'll give your time. You'll give your, your energy. You'll give your, your life. You'll give everything. And you won't be able to give enough. Your desire will just be, how much can you give? Is anybody getting it? It's, it's, not about, it's not about how you can hold back for you. I'm gonna, I've got to keep mine. It's all God. So everything he's allowed, he, everything you've got, he gave you. He allowed you to have that. That's called a trust. He trusted you with something. And what he gave you was a seed in that. I let the seed go. The seed goes back into the ground in which it came. And from that seed produces not just seeds, that seed produces a harvest. So with that little bit that you're giving, that little bit of obedience produces a harvest. And now it's more than you could ever ask or imagine. The Bible says, press down, shaking together and overflowing, right? That he will open up the windows of heaven and pour down so much that you will not have room enough to receive it. That's his plan. That's his plan for us. Not barely making it in paycheck to paycheck and just trying to get by. That's not God's plan. That's not his best for you. It's best for you to be the top and not the bottom. To be above and not beneath. To be a lender and not a borrower. To be the head and not the tail. That's his plan. He says that he gives you the power to get wealth, he says, that his covenant may be established on the earth. On the earth. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 14. I mean, 5, verse number 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but at all points was tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus went through everything that we could ever go through. Every issue we could ever face. He did it without sinning. Which means we can do it without sinning. And how do we do that, Pastor? Do you do it the way that Jesus did it? WWJD, I went over that five lessons. What would Jesus do? We model after Jesus. And in every way that he faced it, he was able to overcome it without sinning. Do it the way he did it. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life, right? So if you want to have that life, if you want to have that life, and not just life, but life more abundantly, you follow the plan that Jesus has. You follow that plan. John 19 and 4, then Pilate went out again and said to him, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Jesus was blameless. But it takes that kind of sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. You remember atonement means that God accepted a sacrifice for the sins of someone else. For instance, in the Old Testament, when you sin, you would, you would die for your sins. But God says, rather than you having to die, bring a sacrifice, a ram or a goat or a lamb, or turtle doves, depending on your sin, that depends on the type of sacrifice that you would bring. And you would bring that sacrifice to the, to the, to the altar, and the high priest would slay this sacrifice, this innocent sacrifice, we had to die. And your hands would be on the head of this sacrifice as it was, as it was dying, and your sins would be transferred to this innocent Lamb, ram, was this animal. So that's how sin took place. It was a blood sacrifice. Blood had to be shed and death had to occur and your sins were transferred to that one that died. But who, what kind of lamb, what could, sacri what could be the sacrifice for all of the whole world? That had to be a huge sacrifice for everybody's sin. And that's why God sent Jesus to be the lamb that would take away the sins of the whole world. But he had to die. But he was the perfect lamb without blemish, without spot, and without sin. That's why it had to be that way. But Jesus came also to show us the way to do that. And we're meant to be that sacrifice also. Our lives are meant to be that sacrifice that we live. He died for us. We live for him. Remember, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We live for Christ. Everything we do is about trying to do what would Jesus do? We're the hands and feet of Jesus on the earth. He died for us. In some cultures, if someone gave their life for you, then you have to go and take care of their family and you're supposed to live for that person that maybe died on your account. That's the way it, in some cultures would be done. If someone sacrificed their life for you, then you're meant to take care of them, their families, you're meant to take on the burdens that they would have while they were here. And we take on that burden of being followers of Jesus. And lastly, he finished his work. He finished his work. When it's all said and done, we're only here for a short time. I'm not sure if you know that. Think back to your life. Remember just a couple years ago, you were 40 or 30 or, remember? It's just like yesterday. And then you woke up and you were 50. And life just seemed to go in, and, and uh, you're trying to slow things down now. When I was younger, I was trying to speed things up because I was always too young. You're too young. I want to be older. Now that I'm older, it's almost you're too old. I remember when I could park in the, in the senior citizen park, and that was like something. Senior citizen? I'm not a, I'm not a senior citizen. And I said, wait a minute. I guess I am. <laughs> AERP is sending me everything. I guess I am. Yeah. They, my, 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 I was that number one client. He finished his course in John 19, verse number 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. What did Jesus finish? He finished the work that he had come to do. And that's the, the point why we're here to do the work. You are called because there was a place for you. You weren't born and suddenly you had to find a place for you. No, there was a place made in this world just for you. And if you don't do that work that you're meant to, to do, the world suffers. The world needs you. There are people around you right now who need you. They may not call out. They may not come to you and, and, and give you that plea, but I want you to know there's someone around here who needs just a moment of your time. They need a phone call. They need you to know, does anybody care? They're right there. I mean, you don't have to go out and try to find anybody. They're, they're around you. There are people who's lonely. 
And Jesus says that as you do it unto the least of them, you're doing it unto me. When we're a blessing, that's God's grace. We're giving the people this, that may not deserve it, you're giving them what's undeserved. That's grace. Unmerited favor. That's what we want. That's what we receive. Every day we wake up, it's the grace of God. Here by the grace, not because you're so deserving, not because you're so good, not because you worked it all out yourself. It's the grace of God that allows you and I to be where we are. And we're just extending that grace to someone else. What you've received freely, you're just giving someone else. Passing it on. Freely you received, freely give. The mercies of God is not allowing us to receive the things that we do deserve. That's another great gift of God. We don't receive the punishment because I know every day we do stuff and and God overlooks that. He just, by his mercy, he just lets us go because he sees our heart. Even in our best, we fall short. There's evil. Even in the best of people, there's evil. But God's, God's mercy just, just washes it all away. In the same way, we're meant to be merciful to others. Don't be judgmental. Because someone doesn't do it your way or doesn't think the way that you do, or like you do, or they, or they offend you, they need your mercy. They need you to, go, to look beyond that and, and see the grace. While Jesus was on the cross, we're going to talk about that next week, he had every reason to, because all the people that were hating him, the, the same week, Hosanna, now crucify him. And my question is, where were the 5,000 that he fed? What was the woman at the well? What was the, the one who's Jairus, who's, who, who Jesus healed his daughter who had died? What was Lazarus? Who were all those standing on Jesus' behalf? But even in that, Jesus' mercy, on the cross, he forgives this thief and says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. That's the mercy of God all the way to the cross, taking up love as your banner, not judgment, just Jesus. Freely we received, freely we give. That's what Jesus does. Father, we thank you for your blessing of your word. We thank you that we can look beyond and still see you, that your passion for us took you all the way to the cross. That we can take this same passion and we can give it to a world that needs it. We pray for those who do not know you right now as Lord and Savior. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, never prayed that prayer of salvation, I'm gonna give you some words. Just repeat these words. Believe them with all of your heart. Just say, Father, forgive me. I repent of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe that God raised him from the dead. And by this confession, I'm saved. I make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. You may be a backslider. You may have already accepted Jesus Christ, but you, you need to recommit yourself. Just say, Father, thank you for never leaving me. Thank you for always being there. Even when I was gone astray, God, you never strayed from me. Use me now. Mold me. Allow me to be what you want me to be. I give you the glory and praise in Jesus' name.